So this is the second part of the course in which we're talking about the issues related to death. And I want to start today by uh, narrating an incident uh, in the life or if you like in the death of the great companion of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Amr ibn Al-As. Amr ibn Al-As was a great companion. And on his deathbed, he started crying. He was weeping and, and crying a lot. And he made those around him cry as well. And his son came to him on his deathbed and tried to encourage him to have good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we talked about in the last session. And he said to him, he reminded him that you are a person who accepted Islam. You are a person who made hijrah of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He put you in charge of armies and through you Allah conquered many towns and, and, and lands. And when Abdullah or Amr ibn As heard this, he wept even more. And he said that, in my life I passed through three stages. The first stage was a stage of Jahiliya. And in that time, before I accepted Islam, there was nobody more hated to me than Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And my only goal in life was to kill him. And had I died in that state, I would definitely have been a person of hellfire. And then after this state, I accepted Islam. And I went with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Medina. I made a hijrah with him. And I went to him and I gave him the Pledge of Allegiance, the Bayah for Islam. And when the Messenger of Allah extended his hand towards me, I actually put my, took my hand back. And the Messenger of Allah asked, what's wrong? And Amr bin Al-As, he said, I have a condition. I have a condition before I accept Islam. And that condition is that I be pardoned all my faults in the past. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiled. And he said, oh Amr, don't you know that when, when you accept Islam, Islam cancels out everything that came before it. All the wrong that you did, it cancels it out. And then Amr bin al-Asi said that after I gave the bay'ah to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is nobody more beloved to me than Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. So much so that I couldn't even look him in the face anymore. I could only, whenever, whenever he came in my presence, I, only, I could only look down. And if you ask me now to describe him, I couldn't describe him to you. Because of his shyness before the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in that state, I would have hoped to be a person of paradise. But after that, after the passing away of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the dunya came to me, and it tricked me, and it allured me. He wasn't allured, I mean, if you look to his life as a great companion, he wasn't allured that much, it's his piety speaking. And he goes, now I don't know what's going to happen to me. Now I don't know what's going to happen to me. Am I a person of hellfire, or am I a person of paradise? And he wept until he passed away. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu or rather, in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an inna ka mayyitun wa, in, uh, wa innahum mayyitun You will die, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And they too will die, they too will pass away And Ali radiallahu anhu would say about this dunya and being careful about this world and advising us to keep our focus on where it matters He said this world is travelling away from us and the hereafter is travelling towards us this world is traveling away from us, and the hereafter is traveling towards us. And both of these have got have their children. The world has its children, and the hereafter has its children. Meaning those people who work for it, who live for it. So he said, be children of the hereafter, and don't be children of this world. Because today is a time for deeds, and there's no recompense. And tomorrow will be a time for recompense, and there's no time for deeds. Today is a time to do your deeds, and there's no recompense. But tomorrow is a time for recompense, and there will no longer be any time for you to do any deeds. So brothers, a reminder, uh, I want to start the session today, this is a reminder for myself and to yourselves and to the sisters, is that we need to be focused. We need to keep our goal and our, our sight set towards the hereafter, towards the meeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards the point of time of our death. And we shouldn't be distracted from this world. As I said last week or last, last time, 
we live in this world, yes, we work in this world, yes, there's no problem with it whatsoever, working and earning our money, etc. But we don't live for this world, we live for the hereafter. We live for our meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to live that eternal life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi, he said an amazing statement. Again, it's something for us to think about. He's talking about what will be our state in the grave. Will it be good or will it be bad? And he said, if you want to know your state in the grave, look to the state of your heart in the chest. And he said, the state that you, you will be in your grave is the same state that your heart is in your chest. If the state of your heart in your chest is good, the state of your heart, state of yourself in the grave will be good. If a state of your heart in your chest is bad, if it's distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it's a sinful black heart, then the state of your, the person in the grave will also be bad. If you want to know the state you're going to be in the grave, then look at the state of your heart in your chest now, before you move on to the grave. Last session we talked about how to ensure a good death. How to ensure a good death. We talked about the state of mind that we should be in. And that is a state where we are thinking, having a good opinion of our Lord Most High Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we talked about uh, that a person should be repenting for his sins on his deathbed. Uh, or when we come to our deathbed, we should be repenting for our sins. And also I add today that we should be making amends for any faults and wrongs we have done to other people on that at that time, especially at that time and ideally before that time, making amends for any wrong that we have done. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he talked about many signs that could be present in a person that are indications that he has, got, he has had a good end. There are indications that he has had a good end, or he will have a good end. And I want to list them here. There's a, there's a long list, I won't go through all the evidences because that will take a, a very long time. But from amongst the signs of a good end, a good death, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is that Allah grants us the tawfiq, the ability to say, to say the shahada on our deathbed. To say la ilaha illallah before we pass away. Allah grants us that ability. And this ability, brothers and sisters, is a gift from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It's a gift that Allah gives the true believer at the point of death. It is actually not easy to say the kalimah on the point of death. We may think now, sitting in this room, that saying la ilaha illallah is very easy. And it is, it's very easy for us to say it on our tongues. At a point of death, when it really, really matters, it's not an easy thing to do. Allah grants it as a gift for those who live their life in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for those who live their life in sinful disobedience, for those who live their lives uh, negligent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not easy for them to say. Ibn al-Jawzi, one of the great scholars of the past, he talked about a number of experiences he had in his lifetime, talking about people's deathbeds. And I, I had the fortune of attending many people's deathbed. And he said that I attended the deathbed of a person who spent his life singing. He was a singer. And on his deathbed, his family around him were encouraging him to say, La ilaha illallah. And all he could do was hum the tunes and songs that he'd been composing during his lifetime. And he kept on doing so until he passed away. He said, I attended the, uh, the deathbed of another person, a very rich man. And on his deathbed, his family were around him, encouraging him to say, La ilaha illallah. And all he could do was to advise his sons about which business transaction he was currently uh, undergoing and how to get the best profit out of the current transactions he was doing. And he kept on doing this until he passed away. He Said, I met, I visited uh, the death of lots of people like this. And so all of them were being encouraged to say, La ilaha illallah. They weren't able to do so. They didn't say this. Allah did not grant them the gift of saying this statement at that deathbed. Because I realized then that it's not an easy thing to say. It's only easy for those whom Allah has gifted this ability to. May Allah make us from amongst those. Dying with sweat on the forehead. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Mawtul Mu'min Min Arat Al-Jameen That a believer dies of a sweaty forehead That when he's passing away, the throes of death, the difficulties of death Make a sheen, a sweat appear on his forehead 
And it's a sign of a good death. It's a sign of a good death for a believer. And some of the scholars have said that the wisdom behind this is that it's one of two wisdoms. One is that the difficulty of death is like an expiation. The difficulty of death makes a sweat appear on his, on, on his brow. And that difficulty is like an expiation. At the very last moments, Allah is giving him this gift of difficulties because through difficulty, Allah forgives sins. So at the last moment, and we talk about this a bit more inshallah, in the last moment, Allah is past giving him a bit of difficulty, a bit of trial, in order for his sins to be more forgiven at that time, or be forgiven at that time. And secondly, they said that it is out of haya, out of modesty and shyness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the believer in his last seconds, he's thinking about his sins and his faults, and he is shy to stand before Allah with his sins and faults. And that shyness also brings about this sweat on his forehead. Dying on the night of Jum'ah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, any Muslim who dies on the day or night of Jum'ah, he is protected from Allah, he is protected by Allah from the trial, the fitna of the grave. Likewise, martyrdom, shahada, is a sign of a good end. Dying on the frontier while defending the frontiers of Islam is a sign of a good end. Dying from plague is a, is a type of shahada, a type of martyrdom. Dying from abdominal illness is a type of martyrdom. Dying from drowning, dying from the collapse of a building. All of these are signs of a good end. These, are, we, these ones we don't necessarily have to aim for, but should they happen to us by Allah's decree, it's a sign of a good end. The plague, the abdominal illness, drowning, the collapse of a building, a woman who dies during pregnancy or childbirth, dying from burning, dying from pleurisy, dying from tuberculosis, dying while defending one's property, dying while defending one's family, dying while defending one's religion, dying in self-defense, somebody attacks you and then you, you, you kill it while defending yourself. All of these are signs, all of these are types of martyrdom, all of these are signs of a good end. Dying while doing a good deed. Dying in a state where a person is doing a good deed. إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا إِسْتَعْمَلَهُ The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when Allah wants good for a person, He purifies him. And his companions asked the Messenger of Allah, how does He purify him? How does He pave the way for him? Uh, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُوَفِّقُهُ لِعَمَلٍ صَالِحٍ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ Allah grants him again, Allah grants him the gift. Allah grants him a gift. That gift is the ability to do good deeds before he passes away. That gift is the ability to do good deeds before he passes away. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave examples of this. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah, seeking thereby the face of Allah sincerely. And this is the last deed he does. You will enter paradise. And whoever fasts a day seeking the face of Allah, and that is the last deed he does, he will enter paradise. And whoever gives charity, and that is the last deed he does, he will enter paradise. These are all examples of Allah gifting that person with the ability to do good deeds before he passes away. Other signs, getting killed by an oppressive tyrant ruler, getting murdered, and finally, a sign of a good end, the righteous Muslims praise that person. When a person passes away, the believers, the practicing Muslims, say good things about him. This is a sign of a good end. And if the practicing righteous Muslims say bad things about him, it's a sign of a bad end. It's a sign of a bad end. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he and a group of companions passed by a janazah. And the companions spoke well about that person who passed away. And the Messenger of Allah said, wajibat, wajibat. It's become obligatory. They passed by another janazah. And the companions spoke evil about that person. And the Messenger of Allah said, wajibat, wajibat. It's become obligatory. So the companions asked Messenger of Allah, what did you mean when you said it's become obligatory? And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the one you spoke good of, paradise has become obligatory for him. 
and the one he spoke evil of, hellfire has become obligatory upon him. Antum shuhada Allahi fil ard. You are Allah's witnesses on this earth. Antum shuhada Allahi fil ard. You are Allah's witnesses on earth. He said it three times. So where the believers speak well of a deceased, it's a sign, not a definitive proof, it's a sign of a good end. And where the believers speak ill of a deceased person, they think he was a bad person, it's a sign of a bad end. So these are all, there's actually in total, 21 signs, there's a list of 21 signs of a good end. Who can repeat some of them back to me? Dying of tuberculosis. Dying of tuberculosis. Dying on Yom Jum'ah. Plague. Sorry? Plague. Plague. Is that dying on plague? Huh? Dying. Drowning, yeah. Burning. Burning. Giving birth. Giving birth. Collapsing building. Collapsing building. Defending <coughs> family. Defending family. Finishing on Abdominal on illness. Finishing on Defending property. Finishing on the Kalama Jaklah. Self-defense. Self-defense. Defending Dawah Islam. Defending Dawah Islam. Defending Defending Being Islam. murdered. Defending yourself. Defending yourself, okay, that's all different types of example they have. Okay, signs of a bad end. May Allah save us from these. Dying in disbelief or while committing shirk. Dying in disbelief or while committing shirk. Dying while committing a sin, the opposite of dying while committing a, a, a good deed. The righteous Muslims blaming that person when he passes away. Being addicted to alcohol. Being addicted to alcohol. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Mudminul khamr in mata laqiya lahu ka'abidi watan. That the, summit, the person who is addicted to alcohol, if he passes away in that state, he will meet Allah as if he was an idol worshipper. He will meet Allah as if he was an idol worshipper. Why? Because he, just as the idol worshipper has given into his desires and lusts and worshiping something besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person has given into his lusts and desires and is addicted to and submitting to the alcohol, subservient to the alcohol. Ill-treating parents, ill-treating parents, not being good to our parents. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, ثَلَاثَةٌ قَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْجَنَّةِ there are three types of people that Allah has made paradise haram for. Allah has made it haram for them to enter paradise. Mudminul khamar, the one who is addicted to alcohol again. Wal'a, the one who is disobedient and uh, insulting towards his parents. What the youth. And the one who shows no earnest concern or has no sense of ghayra or honor for his family. He doesn't care what they do. He has no sense of honor with regards to his family. So ill-treating parents, having no ghayra, having no honor or uh, concern for your family. And sudden death. Sudden death. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Mawtul fajati akhdatu asaf. That a sudden death is a sign of Allah's anger. A sudden death is a sign of Allah's anger. Why? Because they said that a sudden death, a person who suddenly dies, does not have the opportunity to say the shahada. He doesn't have the opportunity to repent. But this is not unrestricted. If you think about many of the signs that we talked about of good end, many of them are sudden deaths. Collapsing building, drowning, being murdered, a shahada for example. So the scholar said what this hadith means, it refers to either a disbeliever or it refers to a person who is sinning and doing something at the time of his sinning that was displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so as a punishment, Allah took that person suddenly without giving him the opportunity to repent. So a sudden death for a person who is in a state where he is sinning and disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sign of a bad end. And also, finally, repenting, uh, dying without repentance. Dying without repentance, especially from major sins. Okay, so these are signs of a bad end. Can somebody repeat them back to me? Doing a bad deed. Doing a bad deed. Disobedience. Disobedience to your parents. Disobedience to your parents. The youth. The youth, the one who has no ghayra, no honor, sense of honor for his family. Disbelief of committing shirk. Sorry? Disbelief in committing shirk, uh, being addicted to alcohol. Compulsive drinker. Sorry? Compulsive drinker. Yeah. Compulsive drinker. Yeah. Yes? Other questions? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, obviously, the righteous Muslim blaming that person, speaking yeah, ill of that person. And sudden death. And sudden death for the person who is? Sorry? For the person who is doing something that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, question? With regards to guarding the honor of your family, what, what do you mean? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. So he has no sense for honor of his family. So, uh, you know, for example, his sister may be out fornicating, he doesn't care. Okay. His brother's out fornicating, he doesn't care. That was a commander cutting the tie of the kitchen, like, okay, you know what, so, such and such is a sinner, I've got nothing to do. Uh, not necessarily. The Zayra here is talking about specifically doing evil and uh, it, uh, indecent acts, if you like. People are doing indecent acts in his family, he does not care for them whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. While a person is on his deathbed, those around him and a person himself who is dying, we have to ensure that he is away from innovation. And innovations are not commi being committed around him at that time. And there are many, many innovations that people commit at the time of death. Um, and if I start listing them as this, there's just too many. Many of us, there's khatams, there's Quran, Khanis, there's reciting Surah Yasin, there's all of these things. Um, there's many, many different examples of this. Uh, one of the great Tab Salaf, Sayyid ibn Musayyid, he was on his deathbed. And in his presence was Abu Salama, another. Uh, 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 one of the Salaf. And during Sayyid ibn Musayyib's illness, he fainted. And they thought, okay, he's, he's, he's about to go. So what they did was they turned his bed to face the Dibla. They turned his bed to face the Dibla. But Sayyid, he regained consciousness. And he saw what they had done. And he asked, why has my bed been changed? And he said, yes, we changed it so you can face the Dibla. He said, no, turn it back again. Turn it back to where it was again. Why? Because this act is not from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ensure that a person who is on his deathbed be facing the Qibla. It is a type of innovation. So Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib, being a scholar of Islam, he said, no, turn it back again. Showing us that the way of the scholars was to ensure that in their presence, innovation was not committed, especially at this important time. When a person passes away, when we pass away, we will all face the throes of death, the pangs, the pain of death. The Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The pangs, the throes, the pain of death will come in truth. That is what you are trying to escape. And for the sinners, the pain and throes will be even more severe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if only you could see the wicked in their death agonies, in the agonies of death. As the angels stretch out their hands to them saying, let out your souls today. Let out your souls. Let out your souls. Today you'll be repaid with a humiliating punishment for saying false things about Allah and for arrogantly rejecting his signs. So the time of death, brothers and sisters, is severe. There is pain, especially so for a sinner, especially so for a disobedient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةُ الْمَوْتِ The calamity of death struck you. Allah himself calls it a calamity. Allah himself calls death a trial, a musibah, a trial, a calamity. But the biggest musibah, as we know, as we talked about last time, the biggest musibah, bigger than the musibah of death, is being negligent of death, being unheedful of death. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself said, do not long for death, for the terror that follows death is immense. It's a sign of blessings to live a long life, so that a person is given the opportunity by Allah to repent. It's a sign of blessings to be given a long life, so the person is given the opportunity by Allah to repent. Even when we look to the death of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of all creation, his death, the pangs of death for him were severe. He, he was facing so much pain at that time, he would put cloth over, a damp cloth over his head, or he would put his hand in water and wipe it over his face, and he would say, La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti sakarat. La ilaha illallah, 
death has its pangs, death has its pain. And he would say, Allahumma a'inni, this on his deathbed, Allahumma a'inni ala sakarat al maut. Oh Allah, help me to bear the pain of death. Oh Allah, help me to bear the pain of death. And then finally, he would say, Fir Rafiq al A'la. He would say, I have chosen the company of the highest angels. And he kept saying that a few times, and then he sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Allah's messenger died on my chest. He passed away on my chest. And having seen him in the throes of death, I would never consider a severe death bad for anybody. Having seen the pain the messenger of Allah passed through in his death, I would not consider anybody else going through a severe death as being a bad thing. But the righteous Imams, they would regard these throes of death to be a blessing in disguise. They would regard the pain, the final pain of death to be a blessing in disguise. Because they knew that every trial, every tribulation, every difficulty that a servant passes through in this world is a means for Allah to forgive him their sins. And they knew that on their deathbed, there were still sins, though they feared at least on their deathbed, there were still sins in their account that had not been forgiven. And therefore they, they thought about this, these pain, these throes of death as a blessing. It's a final opportunity for them to have their sins expiated. This is why um, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Rahmatullah alayhi, he said, I would not like the agonies of death to be reduced for me. I don't want them reduced for me. For that is the last thing by means of which sin may be expiated for the believer. That's the last things by means of which sin may be expiated for the believer. And this is why Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he visited the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again on his deathbed. And he found him suffering intense pain. And he said, I put my hand on the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam. He said, Messenger of Allah, what pain you are going through? And he said, yes, I suffer twice as much as anybody else would. And so I asked him, will you also get double reward? And he replied sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes. And then he said to me, Allah will remove sins just as a tree sheds its leaves for any Muslim who is afflicted with sickness or any other tribulation. So on his deathbed, he's reminding Abdul Ibn Masood that the pain of death is a means of shedding our sins just as a tree sheds its leaves. Or sheds its leaves. So if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam face the pain of death, we also know we will face the pain of death. There's no escaping the, face, the pain of death. Uh, to try to reduce this pain, if we can, try, if you want to, make the dua that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made. Allahumma inni ala sakarati maut. Allah, oh Allah, help us to bear the throes of death. Oh Allah, help us to bear the throes of death. There is, however, one category of people, only one category of people, who will be saved the pain of death. Who are? Yeah. Mujahideen the martyrs. Those people who are martyred sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the martyr does not feel anything more when he is killed than one of your fuels when he is pinched. The martyr does not feel anything more when he is killed than one of you feels when he is pinched. This is of course talking about the shahada, the martyrdom of a person who truly dies in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person goes through the throes of death, <coughs> and after he has passed away, and the soul leaves the body, inshallah we'll be talking about the journey of the soul as it leaves the body from next week inshallah. But for the person who has passed away, there are certain things that those around him should do for that person. There are certain things that those who are sitting around him should do for that person. The first is closing his eyes. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna ruha idha qumida tabi'ahul basr. That when a soul is taken, the eyes follow it upwards. So that when a soul leaves the body, the eyes follow it. So they're open most of the time. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he advised that the person who are, people who are around the person who's deceased, they close the person's eyes. And he himself would do, so, would, would, would do the same. He advised making du'a for the deceased and also at that time making general du'a. 
Because he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the angels are present at that time, saying Ameen. Any dua you say, the angels are present at that time, saying Ameen. It's recommended to cover the entire body of the deceased if possible. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself when he passed away, was, his entire body was covered on his deathbed. So it's recommended to cover the entire body of a person except again for one category of people, who knows? You have to show that. Sorry? The Martians. No. Uh, those who are in a state of ihram. Those who are in a state of ihram. Uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once was uh, performing Hajj and one of the people with him on the day of Arafah, he was on a mat on a beast. The beast threw him off and killed him. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wash him with water and lotus and shroud him in his two garments, meaning the garments of Ihram. Do not embalm or perfume him and do not cover his head and face because on the day of rising, he'd be resurrected saying, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. It's recommended for, for the people around him to hurry with the funeral. Don't delay the funeral. Asri ubi al-jamaz the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would say. Rush, hurry, hasten the funeral on. فَإِنْ كَانَتْ صَالِحَةً قَرَّبْتُمُهُ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ If that person is a good person, you are hurrying him on towards good. وَإِنْ كَانَتْ غَيْرَ ذَلِكْ شَرٌ تَدَعُونَ عَنْ رِقَابِكُمْ If he was something else, an evil person, then it is evil that you are dropping from your necks. So if he is hasten on the, hasten on the funeral, if he is a good person, you are hurrying, on to, hurrying him on towards good. And if he is an evil person, you are removing evil from your necks very quickly. If a person has passed away, it's recommended to pay off that person's debts from his own wealth if possible. And if he doesn't have enough wealth, then the relatives and family should try to pay off that person's debt as much as possible. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Atwal's brother passed away and he had a debt of 300 dirhams and he also had children and Sa'ad he said that he wanted to give the money he had to his children but the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Inna akhaka mahbusun bidaynihi faqdi anhu your brother is imprisoned he's being held back because of his debt so go being, be, being held back from entering paradise so go and pay off his debt for him and once the Messenger of Allah prayed Fajr prayer after the Fajr prayer he prayed a Janazah prayer and then after the Janazah prayer he asked where is the family of this person he asked three times and then finally his family came forward. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna fuladan alladhi tuwafiya minkum qad ihtabasa an al-jannah. This person who has passed away today, he is being held back from entering paradise. Min ajil al-dayn alladhi alayhi. Why? Because he's got debt. Fa in shi'tum fafduhu. And if you want to, ransom him. Meaning pay his debt off for him so he can go to paradise. وَإِنْ شِئْتُمْ فَأَسْلِمُوهُ إِلَىٰ عَذَابِهَا And if you want to, surrender him to Allah's punishment. And then the narrator of the hadith said, I saw his family rushing to pay off the debt of this person. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ مَاتَ وَعَلَيْهِ دِينَارُ وَدِرْحَمْ Whoever passes away having a debt of a dinar or a dirham, قُدِيَ مِنْ حَسَنَاتِهِ On the last day, it will be paid off with his good deeds. On that day, there's no repayment of money, it's only of good deeds. Because on that day, there's no payment of money, just good deeds. This, another narration shows us, this only applies to a person who had no intention during his lifetime of paying off the debt. So if a person is in debt, and has no intention of paying off that debt, and passes away, on the last day, the way the debt is paid off is by his good deeds. His good deeds are given to the, the person he owes debt to. We're not allowed to cause physical harm to the body, the deceased. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Breaking the bone of a Muslim while he is dead is like breaking his bones while he is alive. Also what's not allowed Wailing and lamenting. Wailing and lamenting. Crying is fine. This is mercy. This is the mercy of that Allah places in the hearts of people. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa cried when his son Ibrahim passed away. He said, Inna la'ina tadma. 
the eye sheds tears. And my heart is sad. But we will only say things that please our Lord. And we, Ibrahim, we are saddened at your passing away. The Messenger of Allah said, Ithnani fil nasi huma bihim kufr. Atta'nu fil nasib wa nayaha ala mayyid. There are two of people's practices that are disbelief, acts of disbelief. Dishonoring the ties of kinship and wailing of the dead. Wailing, uh, lamenting of the dead. In the past days, people would pay people to lament when they passed away. They, you know, they would strike their faces, they would rip their clothes, they would disable their hair, they would pay to do so. And in fact, people would actually do this. And even in today's societies, you find in Indian Pakistani societies, especially when somebody passes away, this act of lamenting and hitting yourself and, and ripping your tip, shredding your um, shredding your garments, this is something I still practice today. And this is something prohibited by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam, he talked about a person who wanted people to wail over him when he passed away. Or who knew that people wail over him when he passed away and didn't stop them. He said, the one who is wailed over will be punished on the day of rising because of that wailing. He himself will be punished. If you know that people are going to wail over you and you don't stop it, or if you pay people to wail over you, this is a punishable offense by you on the day, by us, by that person on the, on the day of resurrection. He is not of us. He is not worthy of being a Muslim or worthy of being from the Ummah of Islam. The person who strikes his face, who rips his clothes at this, at, while lamenting, or makes the call of Jahiliyyah, or makes the call of Jahiliyyah. It's permissible to announce the death of a person who has passed away. The Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, he announced the death of al Najashi when he passed away, and then they, they prayed a Janazah prayer. So the Messenger is allowed to make announcements for the death of a person just to let people know he's passed away, so let people know that Janazah prayer will be at uh, a particular time. But it's not allowed to make announcements whereby you are in any way expressing displeasure of Allah's decree, where you start cursing or swearing at the fact that somebody's passed away or lamenting that somebody's passed away. And it's recommended to give condolences to the deceased. To give condolences to the deceased. مَنْ عَزَّ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمْ فِي مُصِيبَتِهِ كَسَاهُ اللَّهُ حُلَّةُ الْخُدْرَى يُحْبَرُ بِهَا That whoever consoles his brother during an affliction, whoever goes to, to console him, to help him, Allah will clothe him with a green suit or green garment with which he will be delighted on, on the day of rising. <coughs> and when Allah's Messenger وسلم, learned of Ja'far's demise, one of her companions, he encouraged those around him to cook for the family. Because he said the family was busy at that time with the affairs of the death of, of that particular individual. So it's recommended to cook for the, per for the family as well to help them out while they're going through that difficulty. So these are things that's recommended for us to do around the deceased as he passes away. And of course, one of the things that we must do is to pray the Janazah prayer. And inshallah, after this course, I will give a course about the fiqh of Janazah prayer just to round off this course properly, inshallah. And next week, we'll be talking about the actual journey of the soul. So we start talking about the journey of the soul as it leaves the body up to the time when the person is resurrected uh, for his judgment. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa ashadu Allah, ilaha illa ant, astaghfiru wa ta'ala, wa ilayk. If there's any questions, they can be asked. Yes? Uh, regarding the, the, the debts, if, you, if an individual owes a debt, was and uh, forgiveness is sought by the, 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 the debtor or the one who yeah. is in there. Would that nullify this, this yes. problem? Yes, yeah, so if forgiveness is sought and the person who the debt was owed to forgives it, then it's, all, it's, um, it's nullified. There's no punishment or, or no, the person is no longer in prison because of his debt or held back because of his debt. Yes? For how many days do they have? Uh, for how many days should they be feeding or giving condolences? There's no limit. There's no specific limit for either morning. Some people think it's three days or five days. Some people think of 40 days. There's no limit of morning because morning is a natural human reaction. 
and different people will have different times of, of mourning. You know, for a person who's, whose child has passed away, uh, perhaps they mourn longer, or she will mourn longer than a person whose father or mother or husband has passed away. It varies from person to person. Um, in terms of feeding, there's no feeding the family. There's no there's no limit set there. It's, it's, it's basically based upon what the community sees. Uh, when, uh, for as long as the community thinks it's going to make it easy for that family. Again, so it's not a limit of three days or five days. Imam Shafi, rahmatullah, he would say one day, for example, but that was his own judgment. He said, I, I see that as good for you to feed that family for one day, but it doesn't limit set for any of these. Uh, Imam Adis. No, no, exactly. That you are correct, and there is um, Imam Shafi himself actually said that this is not a final limit. This is more like a recommendation. Uh, but the actual mourning period is varies from person to person. Exactly. I, I actually forgot to mention that. What about these days now? People say when somebody passed away in his bed, he said passed away, and then peacefully passed away. Yeah. 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 the people say he passed away very peacefully. Yeah, so as I said, these, these um, a person, the question is about a person who passed away peacefully in his sleep. As I said, these are all, the, the things that I mentioned are all indications, they're not proofs. So just because a person may not have had sweat on his forehead, for example, is not a proof that he is an evil person who's going to go to hell fire. These are all just signs and indications that, you know, give us an indication of, and nothing more than that. We cannot be definite that a person who's got sweat on his brow will go to paradise. And we cannot be definite that a person who doesn't have sweat on his brow brow will not go to paradise. It's just science. Dr. Iqbal said something about that very messy. If you can explain them in Urdu. Moti Samad ke shane karimi ne chun liye katre jo the mere ab ke anfaal ke. I can't translate that. When I sat in front of the God and I was so ashamed myself and the what came on my head. And that is the sign of the God's blessing. Yes, exactly. And that is, as I said, very true. The sign of the, the sweat is the sign of either haya or the, the, the difficulty the person is passing through. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, you know, when you said, like, for example, alcohol, someone who dies and he's addicted to alcohol, that is something of disbelief. Um, so can we kind of use that as a proof that say that alcohol would lead to disbelief if someone dies from that? Yeah, you can say that it can lead to disbelief, but you can't say the person is a disbeliever. That's very diff two diff very different things. Or a person who's not just alcohol, a person who's addicted to alcohol. It's two different things altogether. Drinking alcohol itself is a major sin. Being addicted to alcohol is, a, is another sin altogether on top of that. Yeah. And my second question was, you know, with regards to um, when people say, like, I see a lot of this on, on like Facebook, for example, when people say, oh, they're looking down upon us now, and, uh, and RIP, like you know, they, uh, they they went early. God God takes those people who went early, etc. All these kind of things, like you know, are, these aren't permissible. Are they? Um, how do you mean? So may he rest in peace. You no, know, for example, when you say uh, he's in a, he's in a better place now, or he's looking down upon us now. Yeah, yeah. So this, these are definitive statements that we we don't say like that. We say we hope, inshallah, or we hope that Allah has mercy upon him. We hope that Allah took him early before he had assigned, before he had the opportunity to commit sins, or perhaps these sort of, these sort of condolences that make a person feel better, but we don't say any of these as definitive statements. We don't know. We, we will notice that when people close to us, they die. We have this, uh, this sorrow and sadness, and we have this temporary fear for ourselves. And then after a few weeks, months, or whatever, depending on the person's proximity, we kind of forget. Yeah. How can we live and focus upon death without being morbidly obsessed with it? And then being lackadaisical. Because yeah. now what we find is we don't consider death as we should consider it. So we don't want to, that's the right word, um, we don't want to overconsume ourselves, but we need yeah. to be conscious of this thing. Yeah, so, exactly. It's a good question. Uh, we talked about this actually in the first session, but I don't think you were here for the first session. Um, what the best way of reminding ourselves of death and keeping it in our forefront in our minds is to visit the graves. And the Messenger of Allah himself encouraged visiting the graves because of 
he said it reminds you of death. So this is one of the ways and one of the best ways of uh, visiting the graves, of visiting, of remembering <coughs> us, reminding ourselves of death, is to visit the graveyards, to visit the graves, and to look at actually who is in the graveyard. And you see that you know it's not just old people there. There's, there are men, women, children, old, young, babies, all there. We don't know when we're going to pass away. It reminds us of death. So visiting the graves um, is something that we should be doing frequently. Something we should be doing frequently. And inshallah, by visiting the graves, also it keeps us on the straight and narrow, and also it doesn't make us, as you say, it doesn't keep us obsessed with it. It keeps us to a point where we keep remembering about death. So. I think my thought was more um, between the optimism and the pessimism. Sometimes we look at death as like something gloomy, yeah. doom, but we need to look at the brighter side of life. If like yeah, yeah. So um, again, we t we did talk about this last uh, last time as well, inshallah, and, and we talked about the importance of having uh, being in a state of hope and fear throughout our lives, and especially on a day uh, on a point of death, to have hope and fear, but be having more hopeful, be more hopeful at that time, and uh, to remember the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Allah will uh, is the forgiving Lord, but also is the Lord that punishes as well and, and will punish us of our sins. So we by reminding ourselves of our sins. And reminding ourselves of our last forgiveness, we keep it a balance of being in a, hope, a state of hope and fear. I don't know if that's answering your question. Can uh, uh, we multiply Janaza people pray for deceased? You know, we see sometimes if the person died in here, one Janaza prayer or here, then one in the back home, and then like this. Multiple Janaza you're talking about? Yeah, yeah so the scholars differ about multiple Janazas. Um, if one janazah is prayed, it's generally enough. I mean, and this is a, this is a way of the Muslim generally to pray one janazah prayer. Uh, sometimes, uh, if if um, more janazahs were prayed, uh, even during time of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and this was cases where uh, uh, the family, for example, missed the janazah prayer, and the, the close relative of the family actually missed the janazah prayer, and they wanted to pray by themselves. So, where there are exceptional cases then it's permissible to have a second janazah prayer, but to have multiple janazah prayers, like three or four or five or six, something is often so now the messenger, and it's not too small. But that knows best. Yeah. In regards to hastening the, the burial, yeah. uh, what about the narration where one of the companions asked the people to spend time around him, the equivalent time around his grave that it would take for a camel to be slaughtered and the meat distributed? Um, so there are narrations where uh, the was where basically the deceased was allowed to be seen by or given a period of time by people who visit him and, 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 and his family could see him. So the hastening of the funeral, I mean, is obviously is relative, if you like, or subjective. Um, but the point being is that you can't delay it beyond what's necessary. Yeah, that's the point. So if, if family want to visit, uh, want to see the body before you pass away, then that's okay, so long as we're not delaying it beyond what's like customary. So if you're delaying it a day, two days, three days, it's something that's not allowed. Yeah, it's something, it's something going against some of the messenger at So delaying it an hour or two is not an issue. Yeah, the entire difference. Yeah. And just one more question. Sorry. It's kind of related. So there was, um, there's a narration where there are two brothers during the time of the Prophet. And then one of them was very practicing, and the other one was fulfilling the command of Islam to his brains by prayers. And then the... The brother who was very practicing passed away at the Shihi. A year later, the other brother passed away, just normally. Um, and then one of the companions, another companion, saw these two in the dream. And the brother who passed away a year later, who wasn't as practicing, he was seen to enter paradise first. So they were, the companions spoke amongst each other, and then they went to the messengers. And the Prophet said it was his prayer, which put him in paradise first. Is this a general statement, or is it specific to this particular companion? His, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's specific to that situation or not. Yes. What time is the chart, sorry? Okay, okay let's do the last question in the chart. Um, so a person taking pain relief, will he experience the pain, the, the, the sakat of mouth? Yeah. Allah, it would seem that regardless of 
the uh, pain relief, which is really dealing with the symptoms of physical pain. The whole experience of a Sakat remote will be experienced by everybody. This is Allah, this is what the, the text generally, generally states. Because the Sakat remote, the pain, the throes of death, not just physical manifestation, they're also spiritual as well. There's a whole experience of spirituality, physical and spiritual together. So just because a person may be taking pain relief, or maybe a morphine or whatever, and outwardly looks, feels a little lot calmer, he is still going through the pain, the throes of death, but it may be in a different form to what we, from what we physically recognize. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Zakat. 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 Zakat.